Let's get him into the U.S. Senate. That's just a start for him. Just a start. I love you, Dr. Schiff. Yes. It's my mom, Darlene Webb. She's 83 years old and jumping around like a crazy. I just want to say, I hope that when I'm 83, that's what I look like. So. Yeah, she's beautiful, isn't she? Look at her. Yeah, very, very healthy. 83, amazing. All right. So it's it's great to be here. Look, um, we all come into this world naked and we leave with nothing. Just think about that. Just just think what, what I just said. We come with nothing and we will leave with nothing. We're like a blip. But what we do between those two states of uh, existence, you know, there's two points some people would say of non-existence, is what determines what happens. So I say that we live in this world boldly. We live with courage and we live with wanting to knock the socks off everything we come, who comes in our way, who's against you know, truth, freedom, and health. There's no other way to live. There's no other way to live. We come with nothing and we leave with nothing. And every spiritual tradition has talked about that. So that's what you have to really reckon with. We come with nothing and you leave with nothing. So what do you have to lose? You should live as though you have nothing, right? You should live as though you're already gone. Because when you take that attitude, you build a true sense of being human. But without that attitude, you're always holding on to things that have no value anyway in this material world. Nothing, right? We come from nothingness and we leave into nothingness and we can all have ideas of what that nothingness where we came from is or where we go to and, and that doesn't matter. But what it is, what does matter is we're all here at this point, in this moment, you know, in the Boston Common, and we've gathered here because we've all been awakened to the fact that something ain't right, right? And something ain't right. And the purpose of life is to figure out what is not right and to use our very, very precious time here to have an impact and to do it boldly. You have to live life boldly and uh, you have to live it with in immense courage because otherwise it's not worth living, you're a slave. So the real choice that we all make when we get up every morning and, and we go to bed is do we want to be bold human beings, free, or do we want to be slaves? Right? That is, that, is, that, is, that is a question that everyone needs to answer. Well, this place, the Boston Common, in, the, you know, in 1775, 1776, people in this area decided that they wanted to be free people and that they were willing to take up arms to do that, that they were willing to shed their blood to do that because they, they had this deep spiritual feeling. If you go read many of the, uh, the writings of the founders, they had this sense of spirituality and they were scientists and they were spiritualists. They weren't just people who just wanted to do a act of defiance. They had a deep sense of connection to being human and what it meant to be beyond human. So that's why we're here. We're not doing it over at the state house, begging to a bunch of people who don't have that attitude. That in many ways, they're negative of everything what I've said. They cling on to everything on this planet. They cling on to their material world. And they cling on to power, profit, and control. That's what they're about. They have forgotten what it needs to be human beings and they want to denigrate all of us to be slaves because they're a bunch of slaves. That's what they are. They're all slaves. They're slaves to power, profit, and control. Everyone here, and I'm, I want to thank John for saying a few words, and Karina and, and Dr. Robin, is this movement is a movement to en enliven people fundamentally to mean what it means to be a human being. That's what this is about. And I believe, th thank you, that's what this is about. This is about us reconnecting with what it means to be human. Because there are forces of darkness, whatever you want to call them, or anti-human forces, which want to make us robots, which want to make us slaves. In every which way, biologically, forced vaccinations, materially, lockdowns, right? Forced lockdowns, shutting down schools. And all of that is being done because those people, if you look at actually the character of those people, they are not creative, they don't work, 
They don't produce music. They don't produce writing. They don't produce anything. What they do produce is manipulation of other human beings. That's what they do. They produce manipulation and they profit from that. And the class that does that is called a lawyer class. So when you step back and you look at the arc of history, and it's very, very important to understand history because you know, I mean, we're basically a small frame in a big movie that's been going on for a long time. And then that, you know, we leave and the next frame starts. So it's really, really important to understand what frame we're in so we could ha hopefully be bold and courageous to drive the direction of that movie, right? And that's what we have to reconnect with. And everyone here can have a huge impact because I'll tell you, when you look at the arc of human history, there's one variable that no one can ever, ever predict. That's courage. Courage and boldness, you can't put that into a spreadsheet. You can't model that in some computer program. AI can never understand the variable of courage. And it is courage that has changed human history, always. And it could be the courage of one individual or a group of people. And that's what this movement is about. Now, our running for U.S. Senate is not about just running for U.S. Senate. It's about each one of us starting to set an example of what it means to be a human being. That's what this is about. So if you look at the conditions that are going on right now in that arc of history, what you find is the following. In the, 18, in the late 1800s and the 1900s, American working people, working people, this is a Dr. Shiva for U.S. Senate rally, and the subtitle of our rally, which, which is really the main title, says Working People Unite. Right. Working People Unite, right. which means people who produce value, people who work hard, mothers, nurses, doctors, engineers, blacksmiths, masonaries, people who actually work for a living. Yeah. This is about working people uniting. And why is that important? Because if we do not unite, we will be made slaves. Right. And that's what's going on. Right. 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 That's what's happening. And this goes beyond Republican or Democrat. This goes beyond left and right, black and white. Because what's been happening is that the establishment, particularly the liberal elites, and their quote-unquote Republican colleagues have been working against all of us. They've been dividing us, black and white. They've been forcing people to wear masks. They want to force vaccinate people. They're doing lockdowns. All these things are intended to divide us. That's what's going on. That's what's fundamentally going on. So if you look at the arc in the late 1800s and the early 1900s in the United States, working people started uniting. Why? Because their conditions were being squeezed by the establishment of the time. And that's what was going on. And by the late, early 1900s, those working people's movements were growing militantly and defiantly. And a lot of that's been erased from American history. And it was those working people's movements that delivered everyday people something called infrastructure. So if you start looking from that, from the, so that, that delivery was we started getting hygiene, we started getting clean water, we started getting nutrition. That didn't come from above, it didn't come from the Kennedys. By the way, the Kennedys were shorting the stock market at the time, making money off the stock market crash. That's what the Kennedys were doing. So remember that history, 1920, you know, old Joe Kennedy was shorting the freaking stock market. But working people were rising up, bottoms up, mass protests, and they put a gun basically to the elite's head. And they said, if you don't do this, you will have a revolution in this country. Right. And so that's the facts. And what they, so the elites got very scared and they threw a few bones. Here's social security. Here's, we'll give you the eight hour workday. We'll give you some infrastructure. And so starting in 1945, to 1971, you see an explosive growth in the American economy. That did not come from Franklin Delano Roosevelt. If anything, he was a racist, he was an elitist. It didn't come from the Democrats, it didn't come from the Republicans. It came from people's names that we do not even know. They fought for us. Exactly, that's, that's who we should honor. It came from black and white. Black and white. Immigrants from all parts of this country. And those people are the reason that we have highways. Those are the reason that we started getting public education in this country, real public education. Those came from working people who put the fear of God into the establishment. 
And that's what we sort of did here. They try to say, oh, you can't gather here. You can't have generators here. We said, really? No freaking way. This is a protest. We have every right, and they walked away. That's how we win. We got to have people organizing, and we say, no, this is my right. I pay my taxes. I have every right to be here. We don't say, okay, really? Thank you. No, we say, this is a country of laws, not rules. You can't make up rules as you want them. No freaking way. So that's what we did here. And yesterday, we did the same thing in the Boston City Hall. Fifteen of us went over there. Some of you are here. On September 4th, we asked this Mayor Marty Walsh, a totally corrupt guy, where are our, we wanted the data, because we're showing that election fraud took place, we wanted the data from all the precincts. On September 4th, Richard went over there, gave them the document, and they have 10 days to respond by law. They didn't. So we had to go over there. First, they tried to make it a mask issue, no mask, mask issue. But finally, they saw our defiance, and you know what? Within five minutes, we got our document that we had waited for for 20 days. That's a victory. That's a victory. So what I'm here to do in a very humble way is to re-inspire you to start thinking about how we win. That's what this is about. This is not about, oh, we elected that guy, we lost. Oh, we elected that guy, we lost. Elections are not how we win, but it's building the movement. The election just happens to be a, you know, a path we take along the way. And along that way, we start poking the bear. And what we find out is all their corruption, which is what we found out, that they cheat, they lie, they commit election fraud, they throw away ballots, all right? But that's not the end. The end, the means is to, the means and the ends have to be together. We're educating people along this movement. That's what we're doing. And Karina's able to articulate this. John's able to articulate this. And everyone here, the more and more people able to articulate this, we've created revolutionaries. And that's dangerous. They want people who go to the Republican Party or to the Democratic Party or go over to that stupid state house. And by the way, they started doing protests because they see us doing it. And as Karina said, they're being misled by a bunch of scumbags called Health Choice who told people not to do protests, who told women. But now they see us coming up, so they'll also try to hijack protests. And you got to get smart. But the bottom line is, in the it, not, it was because of the militant workers' movements. And you have to use the word militant. Yeah. Let me tell you why that word's important. Because you have to get angry. Yeah. I did, a, I did a, um, a video, and I said, this is fucked up. Yeah. Okay? And someone said, oh, you shouldn't use that F-U-C-K word. Well, yesterday I did another video with a, a very distinguished guy in Britain on Camelot Castle. And he heard what happened. He goes, this is fucked up. Okay? And he goes, I don't curse, but this is fucked up election fraud. And someone wrote on his feed, oh, you shouldn't use that word, John. He goes, no, this is fucked up. Okay? That word was developed to express a natural anger. And by the way, I find a lot of these people who have problems with that term, they curse a lot, by the way, if you sit with them. They're hypocrites. But they don't want the nat natural ex expression of anger of working people. You should be freaking angry. Right, right. We have a right to be angry. Right, right. And they can't, you know, they want to medicate us with, you know, 60% of the kids are on Ritalin. Right. It numbs their emotions. They think they're going to medicate us so we don't get militant. That's right. And I'm not talking about going and burning down stuff. I'm talking about a militant movement organizing bottoms up. Hopefully we don't have to do that. But getting angry and getting upset is a natural human emotion. Anyone who tries to suppress that, you got to say, what's your agenda? Uh -huh. Right? What's your agenda? But it was a militant working people's movement of the 1900s that we got unions. I mean, good unions. Okay, not the unions of today. Because people were being mistreated. And so between 1945 and 1971, if you look at the data, by the way, a beautiful report came up from some honest scientists. The entire American pie grew. We, act, we had real growth in this country. That means if you made $20,000, if you made $50,000, if you made $100,000, if you made a million dollars, the entire pie was growing. If you look at the economic growth, and this is beautiful data that's just recently published, everyone was growing. Everyone's incomes went up by 10% annually, whatever the number was, right? The entire pie grew. The entire American pie grew, and that's when you had true expansion of American growth. But in 1971, things changed. 
And one of the important things that changed was obviously we moved away from the gold standard to the petrodollar. But fundamentally what happened in 1971 was you had the collusion of the Republicans and Democrats against working people because you know what? In 1940, it, they never wanted to give us those rights. They never wanted us to give her the, the eight hour work day. They never wanted to give us vitamin A nutrition. They never wanted to build us highways, none of that. But starting in the late 50s, when it started, any time working people got together, that's communist. That's Marxist. You remember that? Yeah. They did the McCarthy scare. Right. That wasn't against, like, they were concerned about communism or socialism. They were concerned about the American working class rising up. So everything was labeled communist, communist, communist. They did the Red Scare. They went after everyone. Okay? So that's 48 to 71. Now in 71, what starts happening? You start having the consolidation, big pharma, big hospitals, big um, uh, big insurance start getting together. The Department of Education gets created. In every field, every institution started saying, Sh shoot, we gotta go after these working people. We need, we, they're, they're against us, you know, they're, gonna, they're stealing money from us. And that's what started happening in the 70s, in the early 70s. So from 1971 till today, if you look at every income distribution group, the 90% of us, our incomes have not grown, only the top 10%. So let me repeat that. So during 48 to 71, all income distributions grew. It was really an expansion of the American dream. But starting in 1971 to today, the income distribution groups in the 90%, they didn't grow, only the top 10% did. So if you are today making around 50 grand, you should actually be making $120,000 actually in real money today. So where did that $70,000 go? It went upward. So all of these very, very unfortunately misled people on the right who say, we don't want socialism. Well, you have socialism. It's socialism for the extremely wealthy. That's what's taken place. We have distributed wealth upwards, $50 trillion. And that's in a beautiful round report that just came out. So we did redistribution of wealth upwards. We squeezed working people and we sent the wealth upwards. Everyone following this? So this is what you have. This is how the right and the left screw us. So you have the Democrats, Bernie Sanders being one of the biggest charlatans, saying, I want to give revolution. I want what? I want to give you, you know, a revolution. I want to help the working class, Democratic Socialists of America. Well, they're basically fake socialists in the real sense. It's just words that they use because what working person doesn't want freedom, fairness, right? So they put that out there. So they sucker people into the Democratic Party, corral them in like a bunch of you know, sheep. And what do they end up doing? The Democratic Party starts coming up with not proposals to build a bottoms up revolutionary movement. They don't want that. They say, we need regulations. We need to, we need, we're going to protect your safety, vaccine safety, like this clown Robert Kennedy, right? Or we're going to protect you with uh, truck safety, or we're going to protect you uh, so you get proper medical safety. And what they end up doing is, through those safety measures, they create regulations which ensure that big monopolies can arise. Okay, and I'll give you a very good example I'll come to. Now, the Republicans... On the other side, the so-called Republicans, they say, well, we want free markets when they actually don't. They love the monopolies that get created that the Democrats deliver to them. And what they end up doing is they make sure they don't have to pay any taxes. So what ends up happening? Working people get squeezed. So Harvard never pays taxes. The 1.7, the, the thousands of foundations here, Gates Foundation, all these guys don't pay any taxes. So let me give you a stellar example that took place in 2012. And again, you can, this will help you understand how working people are getting squeezed by Republican and Democrat. What happened in 2012? Obamacare. How did Obama get Obamacare through? How did he get it through? Well, go read the bill. The way he got it through is they put in a big thing called, they, they gave further exemptions on the death tax. So let me explain. Let's say I have 100 million in assets by before Obamacare, I could transfer $3 million to each of my children without any, any income tax. Okay? Wealth transfer. It's called the 
give to mine is that? So you could transfer, it was called, the de so, the no, so the exemptions was $3 million, okay? So up to $3 million you could transfer to your child. So in 2012, when the Obamacare debate was going on, the R's were very concerned, oh my God, uh, we're, the, the, you know, we're going to be taxed, right? I can't transfer money to my kids. So before Obamacare was passed, a lot of those people out of fear transferred millions. It was called the biggest wealth transfer in American history. People were transferring to their next generation. However, what Obama did, using that fear, he went to the R's and he said, you know what? I'm not going to take that exemption away. I'm going to double it. So they, they increased the exemption to $6 million. So you could transfer more wealth to your bratty little kids. Okay, who never worked. So it mo more money got to be transferred. And that was written into the bill. And Obama got, so what did Obamacare do? It built bigger insurance, bigger pharma companies, and bigger hospitals. Why? They were given regulations, no competition, and a captive audience. In fact, if you look at after Obamacare passed, hospital stocks, you know, insurance stocks, um, big pharma stocks exploded because he delivered his masters on one wing of the establishment, massive amounts of wealth, and the Republicans delivered their masters, reduced income taxes. Now, who got squeezed in that? Us. Why? Because the infrastructure, where does infrastructure funding come from? The revenue tax dollars we give. And the scumbag politicians that get elected, the day they get elected, they're trying to get reelected. So if you look at the national budget, it goes into three buckets. One bucket is for equity, giving away free stuff. The second budget is for our police, our borders, our EPA, FDA to protect us. And the third is called infrastructure. But those politicians who get elected, the day they get elected, they want to be what? Re-elected. So where do you think they vote for? They never vote for infrastructure. They vote for free stuff because it guarantees they get re-elected. You follow this? Yeah, yeah. So in the United States right now, the United States got a D plus in infrastructure. Infrastructure during the 45 to 1971 was amazing in the United States. And that's when the economy grew for all of us. So they have destroyed infrastructure because the politicians play a short game. They don't play the long game because one dollar in free stuff, you lose 60 cents. One dollar in infrastructure, you get a six dollar return. Simple math. Talk to any economist. So we don't invest in infrastructure and Massachusetts has the third worst infrastructure in the United States. Number three, third worst. So that infrastructure is decaying, decaying, decaying. The schools are 50 to one ratio in public schools. The HVAC systems don't work. That's why these teachers unions don't want to go in there because they've been fear mongered on COVID. Of course they don't want 50 kids in there, right? If you're wealthy, you send your kids to private schools. You know, you have five or 10 to one ratio and you're fine. So that's why they want school shutdowns because they've engineered a world they cannot sustain us. And I mean us, I mean working people. They want lockdowns because the roads and the crumbling infrastructure doesn't work. If you're a working person who lives in Mattapan and you got to go to another, you know, you got to take two trains, three trains in the wintertime, you're freezing. This is a reality. You know that, right? Talk to any working person. They'll tell you how crumbling the actual trains are. So what we have is crumbling infrastructure and infrastructure is a foundation of building a vibrant economy. And they have not invested in infrastructure because they don't get, give a damn about us. That's what this is about. So their solution to that is to squeeze us from both sides. And all of these politicians do what's called horse trading. On every bill that comes up, they shove in something else. So in Obamacare, they threw in a state tax. In some other farm bill, they'll throw in something like you know, you can't sue Monsanto, which, by the way, Elizabeth Warren, a liberal Democrat, voted for. You see, they're doing horse trading with us because they're all lawyers. That's what lawyers do. I'll get that guy off crimes if you give me a, a break here. You know what I'm saying? So no problems ever get solved. Nothing ever gets solved. That's how Massachusetts got to an F minus minus. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of effort. Now, layered into all of this attack on working people, what we, our campaign discovered here 
is they use another weapon. So when one of us, me, or you, or you, or you, or you, or you, or you, rises up from below, creates a real movement we, all over the state. We had, we got over 20,000 donations. We had over, you know, nearly 10,000 lawn signs up there. We had nearly, what, five to 10,000 bumper stickers or more. We had all of you, 3,000 volunteers who came in. We had 500 plus standouts. We had 12 billboards up there. We had network TV ads, radio TV ads, all funded by all of you. Bottoms up movement. Bottoms up movement. And when that occurred by a child of working class people from, from the, those people educated me in New Jersey or my grandparents, one of you, one of us, and none of us see color, we see a working person. They see color. They're the racists. They want to spit black and white. They got these stupid Antifa people yep. fighting, you know, Proud Boys over here. My view is Antifa and Proud Boys should get together against them. That's what should happen. But they got misleaders on both sides who manipulate people. BLM and Proud Boys should come together. That's what they should do because they're both working class. Some of them are working class people. But they got black and white fighting, Antifa versus police, blacks versus police. And they got us distracted. Well, meanwhile, they steal from us and rob from us. That's right. No more. No more. Exactly. No more. No more. No more. This black versus white bullshit is bullshit. And since the Kennedys so-called claimed in 1965, or they're going to do the civil rights bill, $53 trillion got supposedly sent to help black people. The illiteracy rate of a black person today in the inner cities is higher than before civil rights. That's what the Kennedys delivered to us. So we, the working people, have got to wake up. And that's what this movement is about. This is about educating people with the right facts, as Robin said. And you need to start becoming a human being and make an educated decision. Why am I a Republican? Why am I a Democrat? Why am I left, right, black, white? Why? Why am I that? I'm a human being. And if you go use your own noggin and you come down to the fun fundamental issues, our goal is to find the real problem and the real solution. That's what this movement's about. When our movement started growing and we were headed for a landslide victory on September 1st, what did they do? Election, Election fraud. fraud. Election, fraud. Election fraud. fraud. And what we discovered, what this movement discovered, because we poked the bear. And the output they came out was election fraud. And we're going to take all that knowledge and educate everyone. And we're going to get more and more. We did, I think, maybe five hours of advertising here. We got you know, close to 1,500 people already, okay? So what did we do? We were headed for a landslide victory. The working people, all of you, your hard work was headed for a big trophy, our landslide victory. And what did they do? They stole it from us. And how did they steal it? They made sure that we could never, ever validate the election fraud by, and that's fraud, by making sure that they delete ballot images. Right. How many of you guys know what the what election fraud took place? Okay. How many of you want to know the details? Okay. This is what took place because I want all of you to know this and then we'll take some questions. This is what they do. When you walk into a voting booth, there are two kinds of ballots. Got it? Ballot kind one and ballot kind two. One is called a hand counted ballot. The other is a digitally counted ballot image. Two ballots. In Massachusetts, when you walk in, in Franklin County, by the way, we won. In Franklin County, we won. All 90%, 70% hand-counted ballots. Okay? So if that gives you an indicator, we won in Franklin County. All the other counties use electronic ballot imaging and counting. They use a machine called the DS2000. That's a machine they use. So when you walk into the voting booth in Franklin County, they take that paper that you give them with the little circles you fill in, and because it's hand counted, it goes to a human being and they look at it. By the way, they can only start counting when the polls end. If they do it before that, that's illegal. So when the polls end, they take all those stacks of paper, they count it. One vote for Shiva, one vote for Justin, one vote for Shiva, one vote for Justin, and so on, right? In the machine counted votes, what do they do? You put in your scanner, the DS2000 scans it. It makes an image. It's called a ballot image. An image is made. And those images, 
start accruing. And then when they tabulate the images, they use sophisticated pattern analysis. They use the eyes of the AI of the machine. And it says, oh, a dot for Shiva, a dot for Justin. And it puts it into the bins and it counts. So what's being counted in the second case? The ballot images. What's being counted? The images, okay? So that, that which is counted is the ballot. The ballot images are the ballot. That's what got counted, okay? And those counts are then printed on a receipt and you say, Justin got 400 votes, Shiva got 400 votes, 100 votes for write-in, and 100 votes, well, let me even make it even simpler, uh, and 100 blank votes. Let's say no one voted for us. So that's what, 1,000 votes. So if 1,000 voters came in, how many ballot images should be there? 1,000, right? And if you look at the votes, it should add up to 1,000. 400 for him, 400 for me, 100 write-in, and 100 blank votes. No one wanted to vote for either of us, okay? However, those machines have a feature in it called the weighted rate, race feature. More importantly, those machines do not store Justin and mine's votes as whole numbers, which are called integers. Remember in math, one, two, three, four, hundred, 120, they store them as decimals. They store the votes that Justin got as 100.21215. Shiva got, you know, uh, or, or what did I say, 400.2121, and I got 400 point whatever. Why are they storing votes as a decimal number? Okay? In that system, they have a feature called a weighted race. If that feature is turned on and has various different options, Justin's votes can get multiplied by three. So suddenly he gets 1,200 votes. Take my votes, cut it by two. I get 200 votes. So what's that? 1,200 plus 200 is what? 1,400 plus the 100 write-ins, 1,500, and the 100 blank votes, 1,600. Sorry to make you do some math here. Basic math, though, but 1,600. So 1,600 votes are produced from how many voters? 1,000 voters. The evidence of that would be the ballot images, which are the fingerprints that were used. So we know that we were on a landslide. All of our data shows it was going to be 60% for us, 40% for them. And in the hand-counted towns in Franklin County, we won, the whole county. So we went to the, we went, we had Jerry go to Billerica, we had Sandy go to Dunstable, we had different people here, Karina went to Newton. We said, look, we want to see, uh, uh, Joe went to Rockland. We said, we want to see the list of the voters that actually walked into your city. It's called the participating voter list. Bill, Bob, Mary, Joe, they have it, they have the list. So let's say a thousand people's names are there, and we want to compare that to the actual votes cast. Two different spreadsheets they're supposed to give us. Well, they gave us that data. In Newton, what did we find in Karina? 15, 1,800 difference. 1,800 more votes than people who walked in. Okay, and out of the 15 cities we asked for, we've had to like beg and plead by law, they have to give it to us in 10 days. Well, in um, Plymouth County, in Plymouth, 450 more, vo more votes than the people who walked in. Wow. And in Lawrence, about 84 to 100. And we, me and the 15 other of us, we had to walk into Marty Walsh. By the way, we have a picture of Marty Walsh who's telling everyone to wear masks. Crystal got a good picture where he's got his mask down. Yeah, yeah. Okay? But anyway, it t we're, we're having Dr. Vane who analyze that data, but I'm sure we're going to find a discrepancy there. So... The reason that discrepancy is important is because it shows that fractional voting was on. And that's what we're asking them. Now, if you say, well, I'm a conspiracy theorist, well, just show me the data. Right. So when we asked for the data, what happened? We followed all the laws. Working people, you know, we follow the laws. We pay our taxes. We do the right things. They don't follow anything. They're cheaters. Right. They make us follow laws. One rule for them and another rule for us. So we went in there, you know, paid our people, gave, you know, they produced a nice letter. We said, here is our request. It's called a FOIA, right? Freedom of Information Act. We said, we want the ballot images. We want a number of other things. We gave it to them. The guy at the front counter looks at it, who reports up to Galvin, and it's on video, and he says, ballot images. He goes, we don't have ballot images. We turned that feature off, okay? That's what he says. We have it on video. Then he says, hey, man, what do you think? This election was rigged? Out of nowhere. Wow. 
Mai, you protest too much, right? So then 10 days after September 9th, business days, we thought it was September 21st, right, Richard? We go up there. The lawyer shows up and she tells us, oh, it's not, it's 10 business days. So come back on Wednesday. She could have done it right there. Anyway, so we said, okay, come back. We, she said, I'm going to email you my response. Wednesday comes, we get nothing. Thursday morning, me being me, I call him at 9 a.m. Well, he goes, uh, I said, you violated federal law. He goes, no, 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 I violated Massachusetts law. Okay? Because it, but in 10 days, they have to give us that information. So what I, th that response is what you, you, when, when you get in third world countries and banana republics. This is our government. This is my office. You know, I can do whatever the hell I want. That's in Massachusetts, though. So remember that. This is Massachusetts, not Congo. It's not Chennai. It's not Mongolia. It's Massachusetts. So then what happens? On Thursday morning, I call him and I say, you violated the law. He goes, no, I violated Massachusetts law. I said, when am I going to get this? He goes, sometime today. I go, what time? He goes, I don't know. I go, you need to give me a time. How about 4 p.m.? He says, 5 p.m. I said, okay. Well, after that call, one of the things you learn, and this is where we have to be smart, we document that. We sent them back an email. You told me this. And by the way, you acknowledge you violated Massachusetts law. Within 10 minutes, the lawyer writes us back. And in that legal email, which we have, she says, Massachusetts is prohibited. Prohibited from saving ballot images, which are the ballots. Prohibited. So what would a natural person, a working person like us, who's an honest person, do saying, please show me the law? I'd love to know the law. Maybe I'm wrong. Right. We write that back, second email, back to her. Nothing the next day, which is Friday the 25th, which is a few hours before Charlie Baker went online and did that ridiculous talk he did attacking the president. The woman writes back, she goes, uh, we saved the paper that goes in the scanners, which is a federal law, is you have to save it for 22 months, but we didn't save the ballot images. They're not stored. We don't have to. I sent back an email to that. I said, you're violating federal law. You illegally deleted ballots. This election is null and void. I said, I'm sure you need to suck up to Baker and to Galvin to keep your job. Okay? That's it all in the email. Within hours after that, Baker comes on TV. If you saw this thing that he did, and he suddenly out of nowhere is attacking Trump, saying the president will, won't leave uh, if he doesn't lose his, but it was really against us. That's what it was. He was using Trump as a diversion. He was saying, and anyone who loses an election should accept it. Wow. Right? The people have spoken. He doesn't know anything about people. He's not one of them. So then I take all of those emails and I put it up on Twitter. You know, I tweet all day. It's my medium. I use it for everything, for my existence. Within hours, we find out that the Secretary of State called Twitter and they shut down my account. Not for a few hours, but for seven days in the middle of a federal election. Now, as I've shared before, if you heard the African premier of Congo, the prime minister, called up Twitter and told them to shut down, you know, Justin Clea, who's an opposition candidate running against them's account, and Twitter complied, what would you say? You would say that's a third world republic and that, that's, what, that's what they do there. And you would be appalled. That's what occurred here in Massachusetts to one of us who is a bona fide political candidate. This was, and, and the First Amendment, the reason we're here at the Parkman Bandstand is the First Amendment was created particularly for us, each one of us, every one of you to be the press so you could write stuff against political officials. That's why it was created. The founder said every citizen has a right to attack us. You could write anything against political officials. And if they didn't disagree, they could put out their own press. But to shut down the press, the public forum, which is what Twitter is, is outrageous. That's why it's a banana republic. So in closing, what we need to recognize is this is how they operate, guys. We should have no illusions. They're cheaters. They're liars. They're thieves. They're rapists. They're murderers. One rule for them and another rule for us. Right? One rule for them and another rule for us. And we need to all awaken to this and left and right do this together. That's what they do. And when someone comes from below or someone comes like a disruptor like Trump, what they will do is by any means necessary to try to keep us out. And the only way out of that 
is never to rely on their platforms. Right. We have to build a bottoms up movement, right? Yeah. That's the only way. It's the only way. You've had all these sort of, you know, bullshit mid organizations come up, you know? And the not so obvious establishment is worse than the obvious establishment. The Kennedys, the Bernie Sanders, you know, and the Howie Cars and the Jeff Cooners, all of them. They support the right to manipulate the white working class and the other guys, the Bernie Sanders and the Al Sharptons manipulate the poor blacks on the other side. Right. That's what they do. That's why no change occurs. So you have a bunch of fools who don't study history. Oh, Cooner, Carr, Carr's a scumbag. Cooner's a scumbag. He's hurt a lot of people who came up. Go look at what he did to Mark Fisher in this state. So we have to get wise. And the, and, and the reason I'm sharing this all of, all of you, with all of you is this is fortunately the knowledge that I was able to learn over the last 50 years because I wanted to figure out how we win, yeah, right? right? We want to win. And if we don't have the right political theory, we will lose. And we'll be waking up again, oh, well, I got, guess we lost. And every generation that losses occur to us, we get squeezed more and more and more and more, and then it becomes a luxury to fight for freedom. Right, right. So we have a window right now, because if we don't fight, you know, you're gonna be at home, your wages are gonna be going down, right. you're barely gonna be surviving. And by the way, everyone says, oh, well, you know, um, in, the last, in the last six months, the biggest wealth transfer, another big wealth transfer occurred. Six trillion dollars got printed, 600 billionaires, increase their wealth in three months by $2.3 trillion. We have lockdowns, forced vaccinations are coming, children are being separated from their families, you have crumbling infrastructure, that's what's actually going on. They're getting everything they want, guys. Everything they want. And we're here saying, oh, Shiva is gonna split the vote from the Republicans, screw that. It's them versus us, you vote for them, doofus one or doofus two, you're taking a vote away from us. That's the answer. Any fool who says that we're taking the vote away from them, you say, no, you're taking the vote away from us because doofus one and doofus two is never gonna deliver anything. That's why we're doing this, right? We're doing this. This is what we're doing right now. We're doing this writing campaign. This is a show of defiance. It's a show of militancy. It's a show of screw you. That's what this is. This writing campaign is not to say, oh, I guess we lost the election. No, we didn't fucking lose the election. You stole the goddamn election from us. That's what you did. No, we don't comply. Richard said that at the hearing. We do not comply to bullshit. We do not comply. When these guys came here and said, oh, you have to move, we said no. Oh, generators are allowed. We said no, the First Amendment. They left because they know they're making up bullshit. And it's time the American people, working people, stop taking all these drugs that blunts our nerves, that loses our cojones, and we rise up and we fight. We have to fight. You gotta fight. You got to fight. You have no other choice. No more bullshit. And remember, we come to this world naked and we will leave with nothing. You will leave with nothing. All your designer clothes, all the houses you have, all the cars, they'll be gone in, a, in, a, in an infinitesimal second when you leave this planet. So you got to realize that the only thing that's real is struggling and fighting with your fellow human beings. That's the only thing that's real. This doing right in campaign, yeah, it's hard, 